Okay. Welcome everybody to the May luncheon. This hopefully will be our last virtual luncheon. This is one of the announcements I'm excited to present is that our June luncheon will actually be in person on June 17th at Maryland Live. And we've worked closely with them to ensure it will be a safe and enjoyable luncheon. And I'm really looking forward to, to saying hello to you all in person. And you'll hear a little bit later on about introducing next year's XCOM. So let me talk to you about some things that are, are more near term than, than the luncheon in, in June. First of all, very near term, this evening at five o'clock, the AFSIA Central Maryland Emerging Leaders are hosting our annual spring mentorship night. The panel will include Angie Leinart, President and CEO of Intelligenesis, Shana Cosgrove, Founder and CEO of Nyla Technologies, Rob Harrison, Director of Business Development at Innovex, and Major General Lee, Assistant Director of DISA. So hopefully, if you haven't signed up already, you can come and and hear from those four folks tonight about, about leadership and career insights. The other thing that's tomorrow is our spring golf outing. We have over 200 golfers. I was just told a few minutes ago, there are a few foursomes left. So if somebody decides at the last minute that they wanna spend their Friday out in the nice weather golfing, there's still room for that. We also will be having our partners luncheon this will be in person as well. It'll be on June 3rd at Maryland Live. An email will go out shortly with instructions on how to register for that. And we look forward to chatting with all our partners who make all the things we do possible through their sponsorships. On the morning of June 8th, we have technologies over bagels with a technology that I'll admit I know nothing about called Sneak, S-N-Y-K. It's a developer application that allows developers to quickly and easily secure every line of code, something that uh, the people that had the pipeline would have liked to have used. Um, and then a few other announcements. The NAPI survey is out on our AFSIA website. So if you could go, if you attended NAPI and give us feedback so we can make it even better next year, that would be great. And then the other thing we're, we're bringing back that we weren't able to do last year, it will be virtual though, is the summer intern presentation showcase. If you have interns that are interested in getting speech and presentation coaching and also presenting their summer intern project for the potential for some prize money to help offset their college cost, just send an email to sips at centralmaryland.afciachapters.org and we'll include you in the in the presentation showcase. And with that, I would like to present the slate of for next year's XCOM. And we will have a, a vote. I'll let, I don't know if Bob's on, but um, we'll, we'll give you information on how you can, can vote in the slate and I'll, I'll just run through them. Uh, so Bob Mullen, who was my executive vice president, will be stepping up into a president's role. Brooke Kessler, who took on the treasury duties will be Bob's executive vice president. Teresa, Teresa Ronigan will continue as secretary. Jacqueline Rosenfelder will step into the treasurer role. Uh, so she's new to the new to the XCOM. Kathy Dahmer is also new, will be the vice president for awards. We have a new communications officer, vice president, Morgan Scully. Phil Green will continue the excellent work he's been doing as our vice president of diversity and community outreach. Eric DeVito, who's been very active in AFSIA, will be the Vice President for Events. And I wanna thank Kathy for Garrison for all she's done last several years in that role. Mary Stort, new to the XCOM as the Vice President for Fundraising. Mather will continue as Vice President for Membership. He had a challenging role last year with uh, COVID and I really appreciate all your sponsors that hung in there with us and I'm really looking forward to next year where, where everything will be back in person. We're happy to have Stephanie Foster from NSA as our Vice President for Outreach. Al will continue as our Vice President for Programs, as will Jessica for Vice President of Scholarships and Dave Fries for Vice President of Scientific Education. 
Kirsten Miller Jones will also will move into a new role, of vice president, for, actually same role, of vice president for small businesses, as is Devin McBride, VP for technology. Tiffany is going to be in a new role, of vice president for WIG. Uh, John Stressing, who was very helpful with Tiffany this past year, will be our new vice president for emerging leaders. And then Tim Teal and Joe Wassel will be our cyber command and DISA liaisons, respectively. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Tiffany Tong, president of Emerging Leaders, to talk about some awards. Actually, I see a slide I forgot to, to brief here. If you have any questions, and we do have uh, two great speakers, we have small business speaker, and we also have the director of, of DISA, that will be speaking. So if you have any questions, just use the Q&A feature on um, Zoom and we'll, we'll get your questions answered. Thank you, over to you, Tiffany. Hi, good morning, everyone. Today, I have the wonderful honor of presenting our FCS Central Maryland Emerging Leader of the Year Award. That goes to Mr. Gary Singh. Gary has been an upstanding FCA CMD Emerging Leaders Board member as TOB lead for the past two years. During the early days of the pandemic, Gary worked with a small team from a technology perspective to determine tests and stand up, uh, virtualizing all of our program events with TOB as the first virtual chapter event. Gary actually continued through the summer of 2020 uh, with TOB and will do so again for summer 2021, just to ensure continued chapter engagement from a technology perspective. Uh, he's also supported in various additional activities and fundraisers from the Emerging Leaders perspective. So congratulations and thank you for all of your support, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Over to our international awards, we actually have four um, awards this year for the FCA Central Maryland chapter uh, going to three recipients. Uh, the first two we have, we are recognizing Mr. David Knopf and Mr. John Stressing as our distinguished young Axians now emerging leaders. Uh, this, this is a very prestigious international award and it recognizes and rewards exceptional performance um, for, in four different categories. Uh, Dave, our, our first recipient, support, has supported the STEM science fairs as lead for years as the past emerging leaders secretary event support, and most recently set up our inaugural resume review night this year in support of our STEM mission. Uh, Mr. John Stressing um, has previously supported as our socials and technology over bagels uh, leading committee. He's the current emerging leaders vice president and has supported all events for mentorship nights, our, our luncheons, uh, engagements with our, with our FMA partner, et cetera. Um, so John has been wonderful. Uh, this year and appreciate all of his support as well as yours, Steve. Congratulations. Moving over to the next slide, uh, we have our emerging leader as well as our 44 under 40 recipient at the international level, Mr. David Fries. Dave has been an outstanding FCA Central Maryland board member for many years. He's the past FCS Central Maryland VP of Technology and now directly supports our STEM engagement through various activities. During this past pandemic year, on behalf of the chapter, Dave worked with local communities, schools, and internet service providers on behalf of our chapter to ensure that need-based communities um, had proper access to internet connectivity to support remote schooling in support of our STEM mission. Dave, congratulations on receiving both of these prestigious international awards. Thank you so much to all four of our award recipients for all of your hard work, dedication, and support on behalf of our chapter and our mission. Now I'd like to introduce Kirsten Miller-Jones, our VP of Small Business Affairs. Over to you, Kirsten. All right, thank you so much, appreciate it. And congratulations to everybody. Um, Yes, would like to introduce um, our small business speaker for today. Before we do so, just real quick, um, we've pretty much wrapped up for this FCA year, but if anyone is interested in speaking and getting on the calendar for uh, starting in September with our lunchings, which 
hopefully, fingers crossed, everything goes well, they will all be in person. Or if you have an idea for lunch and learn, uh, please let myself or the small business committee know, and we'll get going with that. Uh, so with that, today I'd like to introduce our small business speaker. Uh, we have Lee Sims, the CEO of Quivero. So I'll hand it over to you. Lee. Hey, thank you, Kirsten. Appreciate that. Um, as Chris said, I'm Lee Sims. I serve as CEO at Quivero, a small hub zone business. Uh, I have a background in web-based and integrated solutions. And I want to thank the FCA team for providing me this great opportunity to share a little bit about Quivero with you all today. Next slide. So Quivera, um, who we are starts with our name. Q is for query or for question. Vera is Latin for truth. Our goal is to discover the truth behind the question. What that means is that we take our time to understand the problem, the challenge, the vision, the environment, background, before working together on providing a quality solution. Gaining this understanding has helped us to deliver quality solutions for our clients, partners, and Q family members. Next slide, please. Our mission is to bring forth our experience and our process, introduce innovation when appropriate, and taking the time to listen to our partners to gain a solid understanding. We do this to provide solutions that are human-centric for ease of use. These solutions go through our quality process to ensure it meets or exceeds um, our, client, our standards as well as our client standards. Next slide, please. This is our corporate profile. This is who we are. Most of our workforce is in clear community here in Maryland. Um, we also have contracts down in VA, Texas, and Georgia. We were founded in 2014 and have had strategic growth over the years to build our foundation, culture, and our infrastructure. Uh, we're now ready to accelerate that growth. In 2020, we were honored to be part of the Inc. 5000, and we were top 100 workplaces in both Baltimore and Washington, D.C., um, to all milestones which we're very which we're very proud of. Next slide, please. Our services include cloud-based solutions, architecting, developing, and sustaining solutions in AWS or Azure, leveraging the AWS full suite of tools uh, on many of our projects and bringing together new technologies. Data analytics, bringing data together without jeopardizing data integrity and displaying that data so, it, the, so the intended audience can understand the information to make informed decisions. Cybersecurity, providing cyber implementation, training, and simulation. Mission management, providing the administrative support to support the warfighters, such as training and financial management. Next slide, please. This is our cloud-based solutions offering. I mean, we do everything from DevOps to development, architecture to security. Anything that's in the cloud is, is one thing that we do very well. We've actually been one of the small businesses that have helped um, change and, and move people over from regular environments or virtual environments into an AWS environment, making sure that we can get them through the whole SSP process, implementing solid DevOps processes, and making sure they're using the technology offered in the cloud um, to best uh, provide the, the, the best use case for their solutions. Next slide, please. Data integration, we provide leveraging um, different solutions leveraging Tableau, Salesforce, Blunt, Machine Learning, Kibana, and SQL Server. Our biggest thing is to bring all this data together to make sure that we can bring it together without losing integrity and present it in a way to where you can see this data and make informed decisions. And that's key in today's industry where data is so uh, accessible to everyone. Next slide, please. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is our newest service that we offer. Uh, we just started doing cybersecurity about three years ago. Um, down in San Antonio. So we have a team down there working on offensive and defensive cyber and helping out with putting tools together in a cyber range. So for cyber, we can help protect the data, we can help attack, as well as we can train the workforce on preparing them for the cyber war that's going on today. Uh, we've actually helped with tools that are actually being put onto the cyber range, and it's been one of our fastest growing um, services that we offer right now. Next slide, please. Mission management. Uh, mission management kind of enables us to do everything else that we do. Um, this helps us get the understanding of what's needed out there to better support our customers and the warfighter. Um, we do stuff such as instructional system design to where we're working with NCS right now to you know, develop all kinds of different classes and curriculums to train everybody who's out there supporting uh, the warfighter. Uh, we also help out with financial management and administration. 
Uh, when it comes to training, we can do everything from the system design to the training development to the administration and the training. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about a couple of cool things that we're really doing here at Quivera. Um, one thing we're really focused on is preparing our workforce. That's always one thing that we're looking to make sure that we invest in and keep an eye on. One of the ways we're trying to prepare our workforce is that we see everything going towards AI and machine learning. You know, it's already here and it's continuing to grow. So in order to be part of that, what we've done is we've put together a couple of Tiger teams to where we're doing AI and machine learning projects using um, the AWS Razor. So we went and purchased the equipment and, and the race car, and we actually have a team that's going to be racing in the next event for the AWS race. It's a really cool project to see because they had to use what they've learned on uh, AI and machine learning to program this race car to go around the office. So they've been building tracks all around the office, and it's really cool to see. And it was um, even cooler to see when it was actually working as intended and just getting everybody ready for the next race that's coming up. So I'm very excited about that. And that's just one way that we're preparing our workforce to do more in AI and machine learning and giving them an opportunity to use what they've learned. Um, building solutions to support the RMF. We're all on the inside now supporting the, the risk management framework to where we can help out with SSPs or other things that have to take, take care of the RMF. And we're integrating those things. So before there used to be all these different tools to where you went this, this website for this and this website for that. What we've done on the inside is kind of bring all those into a suite of tools that all work together in an integrated fashion. Make sure that it's a very user-friendly way for people to do what needs to be done in order to follow the processes laid out in the risk management framework. Um, we've gotten rave reviews from the customers about what we've done so far, and I'm really proud of the team and what they're doing over there. The next thing I want to talk about is developing apps and visualization tools to you know, add simplicity. Uh, one thing that we really focus on here at Quivera, we have core values, and one of our core values is simplicity. And what we mean by that is we want to make sure that the people who are coming to our products, our solutions, can easily find where they're trying to go or what they're trying to find and whatever it is they're trying to do. And our whole goal is simplicity, right? And in order to make things simple, it's actually a challenge. We have to really understand the audience. We really have to understand the data. We have to understand how they're going to use the tools that we're putting out there. So we took, we have a whole process that we go through in order to make sure that we're approaching this from a human-centric design. And we do that for our apps. We do that for our web solutions. We do that for any product that we're developing. We always try to take a human-centric approach to make sure that when people come to whatever it is that we put out there, it's intuitive, it's simple, it's easy to use. And we're always looking to expand upon that and make sure that we can get better in that realm. Next slide, please. The industries we serve currently, um, most of our stuff is in Intel, as I said earlier, um, but we are starting to grow in healthcare. Uh, we're doing things for some hospitals. We're actually working uh, with a, a diabetes firm um, to help out with at-risk at patients of amputations. So we've developed this mobile app that can take some data using Bluetooth technology and it sends all those analytics up to where people can see what's going on and reach out to those patients who may be at risk of having an amputation. It's a really cool product, and uh, we're in the trials right now, and it's going very well. Uh, we do things in the commercial to where we can help people out with IT services and implementing good cyber um, posture, as well as we're doing stuff in the federal, state, and local government. We actually have a prime contract right now with um, Baltimore County Public Schools, and we're providing IT, an array of IT services for them. Next slide, please. Innovation. Um, there's all kinds of innovation that we're looking to bring forth to our customers and to our partners. Um, one of the things that we we're trying to do is really change the way we grow our workforce. And we're investing in tomorrow's workforce. As you all know, most of you in the clear community know how hard it is to find the skilled people for with the clearances that we need and the skills that we need to have uh, to put them in there to better serve our clients and our partners. So what we're trying to do is start early. So we have a program, which I'll talk about a little bit later, to where we're partnering with universities and high schools and prepping them for the skills that we need. So we're actually paying them to learn, paying them to get hands-on experience to better help us out in serving our customers. Um, and the ones who qualify, they actually go through a clearance process while they're going through this opportunity. And it's a win-win situation because it helps the schools out with paying, preparing them for their careers. It helps us out with preparing our workforce. It helps our customer out because we're able to add a value and make sure all of our people are ready to go once they step day one on contract. The way we do this is that it's not just lessons that we teach them. We actually give them opportunities to do hands-on experience and really learn. So we start doing prototypes. So with our people we're bringing in, 
we do all these different prototype solutions that we have to put together. You know, we see the challenges that we, uh, that our clients are experiencing, our partners are experiencing, and we take those challenges back to this team. And with those challenges, we come up with different ways of how we can satisfy those challenges. Um, it was kind of awesome to see um, one of the things that we actually prototyped has actually gone agency-wide. Um, we released an analytical tool that was brought into the agency and it's now an agency-wide tool and it all started as an idea. It all started as a prototype. It all started with us reaching back to our other junior interns, we partnering with them with some senior interns and producing a really quality product. So at Quivera, we're always looking to prepare for our future. We're looking at what our customers' needs are and, and where the technology is leading us and making sure that we're investing and making sure that we can stay in line with those technologies to make sure we can better serve the mission and better serve our partners. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, one of the things we're doing is we're, we're partnering with high schools and we have started this thing called the IQ Academy. Um, we're actually working with Baltimore City and a few other um, high schools around the nation and everything. And we're offering a curriculum to kind of teach them the things that we need them to learn. Uh, we're using their facilities so that way the students don't have to leave the facility, but we actually bring them on and we actually have teams conversations to where we're teaching them what we need them to learn and then giving them ways to apply that. So we give them small projects and small prototypes to where they can actually put their learning to application. Um, it's a really cool project. We're really excited to do it. And I think the schools are just as excited as us. And the kids, you know, they're going to win from this. They're going to, one, get paid to learn, as well as they can step into a summer internship or to a career with Rivera or somebody else, um, bringing those skills that they learned through the IQ Tech Academy. Next slide, please. Some of the things that they'll learn are quality assurance. Um, we're teaching them content management, web development, user support. One of the focuses that the schools really said they wanted us to focus on, though, was cybersecurity. A lot of the high schools are putting cybersecurity curriculums into their curriculum, um, and we want to make sure that we expand upon that, you know, serve, use that as a diving board into what we're trying to teach them as well. So we're partnering together to make sure that the things that they're learning in their school ties into our program so that way they can have a continued learning and maximize what we're trying to offer them. Next slide, please. So why Quivera? I was told to keep this for 10 minutes. I think I'm getting close there. One is our IQ way. Uh, our IQ way is our customized agile approach that's customized for the, the, the environment that we're going into. We have various ways that we can plug and play different things that we do within the IQ way to make sure that we're getting the results um, that our customers and partners are looking for. Um, they help us turn our understanding into, into, a, into intuitive solutions. Um, proven. We have a history of success in the federal, and commercial, and Intel community uh, with our past performance. We're a trusted partner. We try to find ways where there's a win-win opportunity to where we can grow together and make sure the partners who give us an opportunity, you know, we make sure that we establish that trust and make sure that we're helping them to grow as well as ourselves to grow. Prepare people. We're always investing in our people and the skill sets that we're obtaining and making sure we have the talent acquisition and education to add value in the communities that we serve. Community involvement. Uh, IQ Tech Academy is one an example of that. We want to be involved in the communities that we serve, and we want to be an active member, which is one of the things we love about AFCIA. We love how AFCIA is working with the next generation and preparing them for a life in science and tech. We want to do the same thing. So the communities that we're in, we're striving to help raise them up and bring them along with the things that we're doing. And we're a certified hub zone. Um, that's not the thing that we lead off with, but we are a certified hub zone as one of our calls. So with that being said, that's all I have. I appreciate you guys giving me the time to talk to you guys today. And thank you, Kristen and Nasia team for again, giving me this opportunity. Yep, thank you, Lee, we appreciate it. And thank you for being a small business sponsor. Um, so next I'm gonna hand it off to John Stressing, our Vice President of Emerging Leaders. All right. Thanks, Kristen, um, and thank you, everybody. Uh, so without further ado, I'm here to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for the day, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Skinner. So Lieutenant General Robert Skinner is the director of DISA and the commander of the Joint Force Headquarters, Doden. Um, as director of DISA, Lieutenant General Skinner manages a global network uh, and leads nearly 19,000 service members, civilians, and contractors who plan, develop, deliver, and operate joint interoperable 
command and control capabilities and defended enterprise infrastructure in more than 42 countries. Um, and so, you know, he's uh, just came over to take over this command role and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, sir. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Skinner, everybody. Okay, thanks, John. And uh, thanks to, uh, to, to FCA, I will tell you, I've been a, a member of FCA for uh, decades, I'll say, and I've been a great and a big supporter of AFSIA too. I, I think this is just a, another opportunity to kind of talk with, with industry, to talk with uh, members of, of the government, just kind of, you know, things that are on my mind and, and, and things that we're doing here at, at, at this so, and JFHQ Dillon. So thank, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm about 70 days in the seat. Um, I am still missing Hawaii, coming from US Indo PACOM. Uh, coming to this weather, although it's getting warmer, uh, it's still very chilly in the morning, uh, which we didn't have in Hawaii. Uh, and the Pacific Ocean is just a tad bit different than the Atlantic Ocean um, and the Chesapeake Bay. So I, at, uh, we, we are missing a little bit, but we are de definitely happy to be here. Definitely happy to be part of the 19,000 member team uh, of DISA and JFHQ Doden and all the great work that, that we're doing and all the, the great talent who on a day-to-day -day basis is continuing to um, push the bounds of innovation, continually pushing the bounds of where we need to go from a, uh, from a uh, IT professional and a command and control and a DOTEN standpoint. So ha happy to be here today. Uh, I have about maybe 10, you know, 10 15 uh, minutes of conversation, uh, some things to hopefully generate some questions of kind of things that are on my mind, the things that we are doing uh, here at, at DISA and, and, and JFHQ DOTEN. Um, I do have to start each and every discussion with a little bit about where I came from here uh, previously at US Indo PACOM and the things that are happening out in, in that theater. Um, those who don't know a lot about uh, what China is up to, those who don't know a lot about what's happening in the Pacific, I would ask each and every one of you to uh, do a little research uh, because I will tell you there is a competition occurring each and every day and it's a competition of the international order. Right, today we are in an international rules-based order um, that is um, based on models from uh, the United States and Europe and, and, and other nations. And China does not like that. China wants a, a closed rules-based order that is aligned to them as the center of gravity. And as, as those who have seen in the Pacific, uh, that is not something that is not a, a a tune and or akin to a free and open uh, global society. Uh, and that, uh, that is happening each and every day and they are moving faster. They are trying to, um, I'll say they, uh, they are competing each and every day. Uh, they are accelerating. And we as a United States, we as a, as a nation and we as a world order um, need to go faster to, to make sure that we are successful and that we are uh, competing competing uh, better. And, and so I have uh, everything, all my comments and all of our discussions uh, today uh, and since I've been here has that as a framework of how do we stay ahead of the adversary? How do we stay ahead of, um, of what they are trying to do so that we can be successful, whether it's competition, crisis and or conflict um, at the end of, end, end of the day? Uh, for those who don't know, um, and as, as you mentioned earlier, the, I, I have two hats. Um, one, uh, the DIS hat, and the other one is the Joint Force Headquarters Doden hat. Um, and er every single day, it is, it is very busy. Um, a, lot, a, a lot is going on, and I look forward to talking a little bit about uh, those actions and those act activities. I will tell you, we have a bunch of key missions that I would say are no fail. Uh, and at the top of the list is our senior leader communications. Whether it's the president, talking to um, his counterparts in other nations, whether it is the Secretary of Defense who is talking to his counterparts, whether it's combatant commands talking to their counterparts and or other combatant commands. Uh, this is at the heart of the, uh, those, these officials being able to, um, to talk to the individuals that they need, need to talk to on a daily basis. And, and so those are kind of some no-fail missions. You know, command and control across the force uh, DISA is at the heart of, and I know there's been a lot of discussions over the last, last year on JADC2, 
the joint all domain command and control capability, which is a key construct in support of the joint warfighting construct and, and a concept. If you don't see DISA and JFHU Doden as a fabric of JADC2, then uh, we probably need to have a conversation and I can explain all the, the different parts and pieces and all of the different interjection points when it comes to JADC2 and that fabric, because uh, we are at, at the heart of that. Um, from a JFHQ Doden standpoint, you know, the, if you look at the Doden, uh, I like to use the, um, the example of, it's almost like the United States, right? United States is 50 states. Um, J, uh, the Doden has what I'll say 44 different states with 44 governors, as we'll call commanders and or directors who are responsible for their portion of the Doden, you know, this federated republic. Um, and the JFHQ Doden gives direction to those 44 directors, those commanders, those governors, um, and then they do things within their, their terrain and within their boundaries uh, in, in support of themselves, as well as in support of the nation as a whole. Uh, and so that, uh, there's been a lot of work in streamlining that, structuring that, making sure that the command and control is effective um, as we see all of the recent cyber events uh, and, and all the, the increase of those cyber events. Uh, that's what things that we're working on a day-to-day -day basis um, in protecting and securing the Doden. I'll tell you the other area that uh, that I would say interests industry, especially is in our contracting uh, uh, section, uh, DITCO. Over $7 billion in obligations last year uh, in support of the department, mainly in information technology, but there's also some other support and services that they are uh, uh, a part of. About 56,000 actions uh, last year. Uh, great work by a lot of great, great professionals in streamlining and getting these contract actions out in a in a timely manner. Yes, acquisitions in the in the department is still too slow. Acquisitions um, across the board, we understand and we know that we have to go faster. Uh, Ditco is at the heart of of making that that go faster. And each and every year, we're we're getting a little bit better. Uh, and so, some amazing professionals uh, uh, across the board. And then I'll tell you, you know the the frontline services, right? Providing support to the White House, providing support to the Secretary of Defense, providing support to every single combatant command, um, providing support to, to the services. There is not one entity within the Department of Defense that we don't support. And I will tell you, there's, there's very few entities, if at all, from a federal government standpoint that this organization and these organizations don't support on a daily basis. So just uh, a lot of great work and I, I'm happy to, to, to go into to any detail that, it, that anybody wants, knowing that even after you know, the, the 60 days, 70 days in, in the seat, there's still areas that, uh, that, that I've not been able to get down to because of the expansiveness of the things that, that we do each and every day. I'll tell you, as I start looking at 22 uh, and beyond and kind of where we want to take the, the organization, uh, I, I think first and foremost, um, and you've heard this a little bit uh, across the department is data centricity. Uh, and I firmly believe that data is a center of gravity and is a set of center of gravity of the future um, and is a center of gravity of today. And those who can harness the data, those who can take advantage of the data, those who can really leverage data are gonna be it. They're gonna be the ones in the, in the driver's seat. They're gonna be ones that are gonna have the, um, the key seat and the key information to make the right decisions at the right time um, in support of whatever mission set uh, and whatever objectives that they're, they're trying to do. And so how do we harness that? How do we make sure that uh, that data is in the offering and talking, um, uh, being leveraged each and every day? Uh, my hope is that uh, we have a bunch of data Jedis and that every single individual becomes a data Jedi of sorts. Those who, who have been in the military are in the military. They've heard the, the session the, or the saying that every individual is a sensor when it comes to force protection. Well, in my eyes, every single individual has to be a, a data Jedi uh, and understand the power of data, but also understand how you apply that data to the mission set that you are assigned to and the mission set that you're supporting. But not only that, but how you can leverage that among multiple mission areas, I think is important. 
And so industries help in not only the technology to make data centricity uh, the, the center of gravity, but also the workforce talent and, and how do we educate and train the workforce so that while not everyone can be a data scientist, not everyone can be an operations research person, they can still be a data, a data Jedi of sorts. And so you're helping that will, will be important. Um, going uh, and thinking through how we, how we transition the department, and I'll say this is not just uh, the agency, but the department, um, to really be a software oriented versus a hardware oriented or organization. There's still going to be hard hardware requirements. There's still circuits that need to be um, that be, need to be addressed, and that and that uh, we need to have from a communication standpoint. We still need to have the infrastructure and the support and the framework to make JADC2, as I mentioned before, and to make other missions successful. Um, but there's a lot of power in software. There's a lot of power in leveraging that software in places where we are leveraging hardware today. And how we make that that transition and how fast we make that transition is very important and, and something that uh, we're looking at from an agency standpoint and from a department of how we we move move forward uh, which goes in line with devsecops right and i know that's the buzzword but i'll tell you at the end of the day what i'm really just focused on is how do we produce capability at a faster pace and a more iterative pace right if uh one of our, our senior leaders i was talking to you the other day mentioned you know, if we're not providing minimum viable products and you know, MVP products within six months, um, it is way, it's, it's way too long. Um, and I think we need to drive that even faster to where, how can we, if it's something brand new, then maybe six months is the right answer. If it's something that is not brand new, then how do we do it in, in a month and two months and three months so that we can get capabilities out quicker to, to those in the, in, in the war fighters and, and in the front lines. One of the things that uh, that I mentioned when we first walked into the into the seat, from an agency standpoint and from a joint force headquarters building standpoint, is how do we, when we walk in each and every day, ask ourselves, what are we doing for the warfighter? What are we doing for the the field commands and the field offices uh, and the and the area of operations of the DOTA and, and all those organizations? How are we supporting them? That should be our our discussion. That should be our our uh, our mantra when we walk in each and every day is how are we supporting them? How are we making them more effective? Uh, because when they're more effective, then the, uh, the combatant commands uh, and the agencies and the organizations are more successful. So that, that's one thing that, that we're looking at uh, each and every day. I will tell you, I think a big bet when it comes to the department over the next couple of years, and we are postured to help make this happen, is how do we really get to a, a better ICAM and identity management framework for the department. We have some parts and pieces that are going on within the department. Everybody knows, you know, the little cat card uh, that we use for, for authentication, but we need to go further than that. We need to understand truly how do we get to not just two-factor, but true multi-factor authentication so that we take into account uh, the location of the individual, the past behavior of the individual, the system that they are on, maybe the endpoint that they are on and how cyber secure is that endpoint. Um, moving the department that way, and I know industry is, has already moved uh, um, towards that to truly have, you know, it's 10, 15, 20, 30 different criteria that goes into whether, uh, authentic, whether access is authorized for that endpoint and for that individual. Um, and, and how do we bring the applications to it to be able to leverage this enterprise ICAM is going to be um, important because at the end of the day, it's the applications that have to change and the applications that have to take advantage of this um, and the interoperability of those applications with the identity management is going to be very important. And so that's that 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 to me is at the top of our list because I'll tell you, everybody talks about zero trust, and yes, the department's going towards zero trust. Um, but the zero trust is, is not the panacea. And if you have not prepared for leveraging zero trust and implementing zero trust principles, then you're going to fail in, in my eyes. And at the heart of that is the identity management. Um, if we get identity management right, then that's going to make zero trust so much, I won't say easier, but so much more powerful and so much more integrated 
as we walk through. And so that's, that's a, a big thing that we're working as, as we look at Zero Trust and uh, DISA just put out the Zero Trust architecture for the department. Uh, we're gonna continue to iterate uh, that, that, that architecture as we take in, as we bring into the, the, these other technologies and these other um, uh, applications, uh, the reference architecture will, will, will have to continue to uh, increase. The other thing that we're really looking at is how do you prove a negative? But what, I, what do I mean by that? It's, it, it's as you've seen with Colonial, um, as you've seen with uh, Pulse Secure, as we've seen with Microsoft, as we've seen with, with other instances uh, and, and events from a cyber vulnerability standpoint, how do we know that we're safe? How do we know that we are protected? How do we know that we are not vulnerable? How do we know that um, as an organization and, and as a, a department, just as industry is looking to, how, how do they know? Um, it, it's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to say with 100% confidence and, and or, or high confidence that uh, you are clean and your terrain, your cyber terrain is clean, your cyber domain is clean. So how do we prove that? Um, uh, that's where I think industry can really help to understand how do you prove that and how do you, whether it's 100% proof or whether it's high confidence, uh, what's the criteria, what technology can be, can be leveraged to continue to show that we are protected, that we are secure, that our posture is as high as it can be with the, uh, with the available resources and, and, and with the posture that we have today. So that, that's very important. The other thing that we're really working on is how do we drive optimization in this thing we call the commander-centric operational framework. As we have these 44 different federated states, federated areas of operation, how do we make those commanders more effective for the train that they are in? And then how do you bring all that information and all that protection and all that situational understanding up to the enterprise and cross-cutting among the states and among these area of operations so that each area of operation, each commander, each director has the same information from a threat standpoint, has the same information from a blue protection standpoint, because uh, you have to understand not just what's happening within your area of operation, but you have areas of interest and you have other areas uh, across the board that you're also interested in. It's almost like uh, from a force protection standpoint in your house, it's great to have, have your house locked up and, and all secure, but if your neighbors, isn't and if, if if down the street isn't, then crime is going to be be part of your day to day, uh, and you and you can't just lock up everything because you have to leave, and so data has to leave uh, your your organization, your area of operation. So how we do that uh, is going to be important, uh, and in I'll say industry's help uh, will also help us with that as as we move forward. I'll say the final piece that uh, that I'll talk about, and then I'll, I'll open up for questions is talent, uh, and how do we um, continue to professionally develop our talent? How do we continue to professionally um, improve from an education standpoint, from a training standpoint? How do we better make use of the total force, uh, which is a very powerful force that I know the, the citizen airmen and the citizen warriors that, that we have out there, and a lot of them are on this line. Um, how do we take full advantage of those? How do we take full advantage of industry to help educate and help train uh, our force so that uh, that, that uh, the force, uh, while I will offer, continues to be the most powerful force in the world, the most powerful military in the world because of our personnel. Uh, we can't rest on the laurels and we have to continue to improve and, and press on that. And so how, how we take care of our military, how we take care of our, our civilians, and how we take care of the contractor force that is supporting us each and every day. Uh, that, that's on our mind. That's something that we're continuing to work through um, and, and, and how we uh, how we take care of them from a training and education standpoint. So with that team out, um, John, I'll turn it back over to you for any questions, comments. Um, I hope I, I, I wet the whistle, uh, as I'll say, from, from everyone. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have, have, have some questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have one question here. Um, what are your plans for leveraging AI ML across your data centric platform to take advantage of the massive data scale? Well, I'll tell you that that that's at the heart of it, right? And you know, whether you want to use you know robotics process automation, whether you want to use you know 
AI as a, as a term and or machine language. Um, it, to me, that when you have a data Jedi, uh, the data Jedi yeah. knows, the op, knows the technology, knows the data, and then also knows the mission so they can leverage AI to get at the, the, the right forensics and the right data. Um, so that is at the heart of everything, everything that we do. Um, I, I will tell you that you know, from a network defense standpoint, uh, that, that's in the wheelhouse. Uh, to me, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning really is at the application level and those application owners, to me, really have to understand how they do that. And, and I would say, you know, we, we can help them, right? We have AI experience, we have machine learning experience that we can help them um, just as they are um, re-engineering their applications. Um, it has to you know, include AI and, and ML. So I'll awesome. that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great answer, <clears throat> particularly for me. Um, how do you see DISA Joint Force Headquarters Dota in supporting the executive order on cybersecurity threat information sharing? This is a two-part question. Are the appropriate enterprise tools in place to interoperate across services, combatant commands, and agencies? So I, you know, I could take an easy answer that say we are in full support of the executive order and no, we do not have the tools uh, to, to uh, ensure, ensure the integration. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm, uh, uh, those who have heard me talk before have heard me say, um, I, I don't want more tools. Uh, I will tell you, we have so many tools uh, that are optimized, we don't use well, um, and it, it's just, it, it's a burden, right? You know, when, when I was in the Air Force, as an example, uh, we had, from the cyber defense tools, we had like 40 of them, 40 di di different ones. And yeah. look at it from a talent management standpoint, having that many different tools, uh, it's hard to, to make sure that as a person moves from base X to base Y or from this organization to this organization, that they, they have the right, the right skills. Um, I, I will tell you, it's getting better, uh, right? As, and if you look at, if we really go to this data centric model across the department, then that will take care of the situational awareness shortcomings that, that we have today that'll take care of some of the things that we're not able to see today because it's all gonna be data centric and all it takes is the application to actually pull the right data together to show you the right picture and or to show you the, for you to have the right insight. Um, so I will tell you, those who have not looked at the executive order, um, I, I would offer you, I, I would go look at it. Um, there are some very lofty goals in there. Um, and, and I think it's, um, um, they're stretch goals. As, as I'll say, stretch objectives. Um, and it's something that we are in line with and we want to push, push for because at the end of the day, the more secure we are while also taking, um, you can't lose sight of user experience, right? So there's a balance here. Uh, but the, I think all, all the goals are leading us as a, as a nation for, uh, forward. I, I will tell you from a DHS and a CISA standpoint, we have the best partnership and the relationship from a DOD standpoint that, than we've ever had. And so part of what we're looking at is how do we continue to enable the partnerships because we can't go it alone. Uh, industry can't go it alone and neither can other federal agencies. And so the, the partnership, and this is one example of the partnership, you know, just with FCA, uh, that the partnership is very important as we go forward, over. Awesome, uh, they're, they're rolling in right now. <clears throat> When will DISA normalize CMMC as a part of contractor relationships, i.e. go beyond pilots and pathfinders? I, I would love to say yesterday, um, but, but I'm not certain they, exactly where that is. But, um, I, I would tell you that that's one that, that I will have to get back to, to, to you on because I, I don't have enough insights into the pilot um, and, and, and what we were trying to do with, with C, CMMC. Okay, awesome. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Lieutenant General Skinner. Thank you for your time. Speaking of zero trust, how do we present new cyber tech that could level the cyber defensive playing field for our cyber blue team defenders against attackers with unlimited time and resources? How do you present new cyber? Say that first part again, John. So it's uh, speaking of zero trust, how do we present new cyber tech that could level the cyber defensive playing field for our cyber blue team defenders against attackers with unlimited time and resources. I don't know if that's the question for how to introduce new technology to DISA or if there's 
technical exchange meetings, maybe. Yeah, um, so, so I'll tell you, what, you know, we have a, a mission partner engagement office um, that that industry and and our, our mission partners come come to us with different offerings, um, different um, kick, different kick capabilities. I would say that that's that's kind of first place. If the question was on how do we bring technology to this uh, from an, an evaluation standpoint, I uh, I will tell you from a blue team standpoint, um, we we don't own the blue teams and the I'll say the cyber protection teams, although we, we own some. You know the the services own some cyber command um, is really kind of the joint force trainer, joint force provider when, when it comes to the CMF, and so that would probably be another avenue of working with the J6 and cyber command and or the, and or the J8. Um, I, I will tell you, we do have to get to zero trust um, as an org because that just enables the blue teams and the protection teams as we're, as we're hunting for the adversary. And, and I'm not certain the adversary has unlimited time, um, but we need to leverage technology to reduce the gap in what the adversary is able to do and be agile and mobile on and, and what our, our defenses are, because we can put up a defense, but if it's too late, then the adversary is well, uh, uh, well past where that defense is. And so the ability to continuously monitor, continuously assess uh, is, is important as we move forward. Awesome, thank you. Um, could you talk about the role you would like to see commercial cloud providers play in enabling improved Doden protection? I think uh, commercial cloud is a huge part of that. Um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, it's, you know there, there's a notion of, you know, do you build it on-prem, do you build it off-prem, off is, a, is a cloud instantiation that the government has to build versus commercial? I, I think this is all hybrid-based. Uh, I think there's mm -hmm. certain times where you have, uh, you know, where you may want the government to, to build it and build it on-prem. There's other times that you want to leverage commercial industry. I will tell you the one thing that we are very focused on is not inhibiting companies' ability to innovate. Um, the more unique requirements that DOD puts on something, the less that we are able to take advantage of industry's innovation and what they are doing, and, and not just innovation, but the time frame that the innovation occurs. So as we look at these, and, and cloud is just one example, as we look at, 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 at technology, we want to limit the number of, I'll say, specified requirements uh, when it comes to the capabilities to enable that, that in innovation. And so from a commercial cloud standpoint, uh, we are all in on, on, on leveraging that fully um, across the board, especially as we start talking about enterprise versus tactical and the disconnected environment um, that, that industry has been, been fully working on here. So. You know, this is the most questions I've seen since we uh, started virtual, sir. Um, <clears throat> so uh, from Ryan Hendrickson, uh, how are you leveraging existing ICAM solutions and teams the agency has to the new DISA solutions? How are you leveraging existing ICAM solutions and teams, I guess, in comparison to the agency has new DISA solutions? So, so I will say... Uh, um, I'll tell you, from a specific standpoint, I'm not certain exactly how we are, but the 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 mindset is is that we we try and you know again we don't want to make something if something's already there, right? So you know why why would we um, make something when we can buy it um, and or use something that, that's already out there? So part of the team that is working this um, is going to be looking at things that are out there already and can we just adopt? Right, because that would be probably the, if, if it meets the requirements, that would be the e easiest way to to uh, to adopt that. And so that uh, I would say, long story short, um, we are going to leverage what is out there when possible. We're going to leverage the teams that are out there and, and the expertise. And we're not going to do this alone, right? We're going to be looking at industry to help us kind of frame uh, w what the future holds. Over. Awesome. <clears throat> I think this is the, the last one unless more trickle in. Uh, this is from Rick Norton. He says, thank you for your service, sir. Good to see you again and, and have you back. Uh, question, touching the data centric piece on how do you, how do you, how do you do what uh, DISA is doing versus what the Jake, for instance, is doing in the area of data, JEDI, AIML, et cetera. 
Yes, mentioned differentiators between DISA and others, i.e. the Jake. Okay. Uh, kind of part of DISA, right? Uh, uh, here's how, 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 here's how I, I would answer that. Um, Jake and DISA are um, aligned at the hip when it comes to AI and, and ML, right? Um, we have a, a key part to play from a data hosting standpoint, um, from a, uh, in, in support of the Jake, um, they have kind of the, 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 the uh, I'll say an analytics as, as does, does DISA. So everything that the Jake is doing, we are aligned with just as they're, they are aligned with us. Um, they're also, uh, we provide administrative support to the Jake um, from a, a variety of, of avenues. Uh, and so the things that they're doing, um, we are aware of and, and vice versa. And we also have some projects together um, as we move forward. So um, I'll say, uh, again, uh, we don't do things alone. Um, and while Jake is the, uh, the AI center of excellence, um, we are leveraging them to help uh, the things that, that we are doing from an application standpoint, right? Whether it's financial, whether it's contracts, whether it's uh, you name it. The other area that I think uh, those who aren't involved in, but uh, should probably take, take a look at is this whole, you know, ro robotics process automation. And, you know, so some people say, well, that's just a new term for, for old, old things that, that, you, that we use from an optimization standpoint. But I think some of the companies out there have some very great technology in regards to how you optimize existing processes um, to, to build capacity, which, which at, at the end of the day, um, resources um, are going to, uh, I'll say, be reduced in the future. It's just all you got to do is look at what's happening from a national standpoint and realize that, uh, um, and so how do we optimize what we have? How do you make the streamline the processes that you have and, that, and the technologies there, RP is one of them, as well as a bunch of others that I know industry is using. Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> well, that's, that's, that's all I've got over here. But okay. That was, uh, that, was, that was an incredible amount of engagement for, uh, for an online event, um, certainly for us. So I appreciate your time, sir. Yep. Thanks, John. And, and what I tell everybody is, is if you had a question and, and you didn't want to ask it in front of everybody, just shoot me an email. You know, I'm on the global, um, you know, ha happy to answer any question. My, as I tell everybody, my email skills are horrendous uh, when it comes to managing my, my inbox, but I will get back to it um, if, if, if you have any questions. And, uh, and this is happy to engage with industry. We're happy to support the department. A lot of great individuals in this organization who are just doing amazing things. And I think with the power of industry and DISA, we can do that many more amazing things.